That's true. Above the law. I love it. Well, we get started a little early. It's fine. Maybe we can wrap early, eh? Okay, so security on the cheap is the name of the talk. Uh, my name is Joel Cardella. I'm going to be talking to you about some fundamentals in security and some ways that you can address those fundamental issues. So here's some biographical info, which I always include on any of the slides I do. I've had 20 years in information technology. I'm this regional security officer. I'm this blah, 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 blah. But really, it doesn't matter. None of this really matters. I could be anybody talking to you because the topic that I have is a common sense topic, OK? This is really all about thinking about our basics and not buying into the hypocalypse, which is a coin that Jack Daniel term, which I thought was fantastic. Um, I've been collecting various pieces of information over the last few months. Um, when I first started doing this talk, it really was a talk about back to basics. And I said, look, we have to concentrate on our fundamentals. We're losing sight of it. We're, we're chasing the sexy. We're chasing the, the new stuff that's out there. So basically, the last presentation, like completely the opposite of what I would have told you guys. right? So forget everything he said and listen to me instead. And uh, so w I gave it a few times, and people came to me, and they said, what you're talking about is great but you don't have any substance for us. We need to understand when you say, yes, we need to do this thing at a basic level, what can we do? That's a really good point. So I've included some things, but please do not consider me a subject matter expert. I'm a manager for God's sake, right? I don't know anything. I would consider people who actually do the work to be subject matter experts. Experts, But the work isn't that hard, that's the point. So I've been collecting these various tweets and, and it's kind of interesting. Um, here's one from uh, Wolf who's basically saying, we never have enough time, budget, or resources to do anything, and then we have to focus on results, which is absolutely true. Um, here's a, a, a great blog post that I found where we talk about basic security starting with fundamentals, and we should build our critical vulnerabilities or our critical security issues and build our way up to other controls. But what really winds up happening is we procrastinate, we hope, we pay, we panic, and then by that time it's too late and we buy the latest type product. It's absolutely true. I mean, this happens, this happens in the enterprise I control. That's how bad it is, right? Because the hypocalypse, it just draws you in. Again, Jack Daniel, another day, another hypocalypse, but just sit there waiting for news. Don't worry about the dumb stuff still unresolved on your systems. How many people do not have any unresolved issues in their enterprise whatsoever right now? Excellent. Well done, sir. There's the door. Right? If your roof leaks, and you have to, you have to fix the leaks in the roof before you remodel the house. Right? It's really simple stuff. What occurred to me as I was gathering all this information, and I'm walking around at security conferences screaming about, oh, back to basics, we got to think about basics. We're really all saying the same thing, which is don't lose sight of these basic issues which are critical to us doing business. All right? And I am going to talk to you in the context of doing business, because really that's the, the position that, that I'm most familiar with. You know, a good example is antivirus. Is there anybody? Here, and I, I'm not being facetious when I ask this, you, do you honestly think antivirus protects your enterprise? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you then are going to throw away antivirus and not use it at all after today? Okay. Other than the facetious gentleman in the back, it's the same number. Because antivirus does a job. What it does is it reduces the noise and it lets us concentrate on things that are really, really important. That is a primary focus of Back to Basics. We want to do the things that reduce the noise so we can actually concentrate and focus on the things that are important. And maybe we can work in a maturity way toward the latest hype product and get value out of that. Because here's the problem. When you buy the latest hype product and you're not ready for the latest hype product and you still have problems at your foundational level, you now have run out of time. You cannot now address the things that need to be addressed as well as the things you want to be addressed and then the things we consider critical within the space of what that, that product sold you. So you've been sold a product that you can't really use, that you can't really leverage. That's a value issue. And as a security person, I have a very limited budget. I cannot afford to spend money that I'm not getting value on. So for me, it's all about basics. Once you make sure you have your basics in place, then you move on and do the other stuff. And that's what this is all about. So. I tried to do some, with some stuff with colors, it's just not working out. But essentially, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about prevention, I'm going to talk about recovery, I'm going to talk about response, and a little bit about detection. Um, because to me, detection is really a much more mature methodology. The key point here is that basics does not adva address advanced threats. That's not what we're talking about. We're really talking about 
the foundational things that we need to clean up the critical elements that exist in our enterprise. And when I talk to you about these things, with the exception of one, there are ways to do this pretty economically. Okay? So before we get into that, let's just talk a little bit about risk. So in terms of risk, um, I borrowed a, a quote. Normally I give attribution, and I should have on here, but this is from uh, Dr. Eric Cole from SANS. Um, his calculation is threat times vulnerability equals risk. I modified that calculation slightly, and I said, really, threat times vulnerability times time equals risk. Because what we're saying here is we're saying as threats go up, risk goes up. As vulnerabilities go down, risk goes down. And as time gets longer, risk gets longer or goes up, right? So it really is sort of a, a calculation method. Now, the issue with this calculation is we don't have any control over the threats. The threats are what they are. We, we cannot do anything proactively to eliminate threat before it is a threat. Right, So we have no control over that. So why in the hell would we spend any time at all trying to mitigate stuff here when we don't have control over it? And there are products out there that promise to do that. They really do promise. You have to read them closely, read the fine print. Okay, If you ever hear the letters GRC in that combination, that's what they pretend to do. And it, it's wrong. They don't. Vulnerabilities is kind of a weird thing. We have both direct and indirect control over our vulnerabilities. Indirectly, we have to wait for the vendors to do something. They have to issue a patch. Maybe they have to issue a release. Something happens. So there's a period of time where we're sort of waiting for the vendor to take an action. But once the vendor has taken an action, that's now in our direct control to do something about. So we have to deploy that patch, or we have to, to issue that release, or whatever it is we need to do, force that change in the enterprise in order to lower our risk. And then, oddly enough, the thing we have the most direct control over is our time. Now, you may not feel that way because maybe your priorities are assigned to you by, by entities outside of you know, your sphere or things that you can't control. But truly, you have the most control over your time. So when we talk about back to basics, we're really talking about investing the time that it takes to get your enterprise shored up to the point where you can go, OK, I have a little breathing room. Now let's look at the next thing or deal with the next issue, whatever it is. Right? So time is the key factor for us. None of these values is ever zero. We should always work towards zero. Zero threats, zero vulnerabilities. Well, not zero time, but you, you get what I'm saying. Zero time spent on the other stuff. Right? OK. So security basics. First of all, security requires resources. You have to invest to get a return. It doesn't magically happen. Whether it's time, whether it's money, whether it's people, you have to make an investment in some way, shape, or form. If you are not the person that controls those things, you need to get this message to your management and say, look, it's one of these. Pick one. I don't care which one, but it's one of these we have to invest in. If you don't invest the resources, you will increase the vulnerability and likelihood and thus the risk. It's a very simple calculation. If you're not putting in the time, the risk is going to go up. If you can't invest money, then you invest time because time is money, right? We've all heard that, that quote, time is money. In this particular case, it's absolutely true. When I have zero resources, but I have X time, I'm going to use that to supplant the resources and do something with it, right? So the, but the question is, how do we do this I'll say cheaply. I don't like the word cheap, but you know, it's a it's a marketing thing, right? Draws people in. That's why you're all here, suckers. Right? All right. So what do we do? How do we invest our time? This is one of the greatest XKCDs ever. Situation, there are four competing standards. Somebody gets outraged and says, 14 is ridiculous. We need one universal standard that covers everybody's use cases. Yeah. And very soon we have 15 competing standards. Because that's what happens, right? So there's a bunch of standards out there. I'm not favoring one over the other because of my like for that standard or because of my predilection toward it or because I'm selling a product which happens to use that standard as, as, its, uh, as its framework, which there are products out there that do. I'm picking these two because I understand them and they're the easiest for me to understand. So I look at the 20 critical controls, also known as the SANS 20, and I look at the, the Defense Signals Directorate from Australia, which interestingly enough effectively say the same thing. And if I can understand them, and I can get others to understand them, like my management or my staff or whatever I need, that's a good thing, right? So what do they say? I'm not going to go into them all. That's a whole, like, another talk in itself. That was the whole back to basics talk that I did. But essentially, distilled down, if we take the SANS 20 or we take the first four critical uh, issues from the Defense Signals Directorate, we wind up with these five basic points. So this is all, all about back to basics. This is where we focus our time to get the most return out of our investment. So we do application whitelisting, right? We don't allow applications to run in our enterprise that are not authorized to run. We use standard and secure system configurations, so gold images, if you will, for our servers, for our endpoints, for, for anything. 
We patch our application software within 48 hours. We patch our application, or we patch our OS hardware within 48 hours. And then we reduce the number of people that have administrative privilege. Or really, I'll say privilege beyond what they need. Administrative is a good term because you understand it, but I want you to understand that nobody in your enterprise should have more access than they need to do anything, right? And that is something you do have direct control over, believe it or not. Now, again, you might get management pushback. I'm not saying it's an easy thing, but it's something you do have control over. It's very easy to control and very easy to mitigate risk as a result. So when we look at the first five, what I did is I took, uh, this is actually the DSD's view of how these controls work, and I took the first five and I plugged them in, and the DSD kind of does this cool thing where it rates them, and it's like, here's the effectiveness, here's the resistance by the user, here's the upfront cost and staff equipment complexity, here's the, the ongoing maintenance cost, and then does it help detect intrusions and mitigate the three stages of network intrusion, right? Which is kind of a neat thing, and if you look on there, the only one really, in terms of up, upfront cost, although high is listed in patch applications, I'm gonna, I'm gonna dispute that one a little bit, High on application whitelisting, I absolutely agree. This is the one that you're just not going to get away with cheaply, okay? You can get certain things out of it if you're bundled, like if you have an enterprise agreement in your Microsoft uh, infrastructure, and you can take advantage of services like AppLocker, right? You can get application whitelisting that way, but that's really not true application whitelisting that you'd get with, with a really robust product. So I'll agree with this to some point and say, application whitelisting we probably can't do cheaply. However, if we can do the others cheaply, then maybe we can focus the rest of our resources on application whitelisting, thereby improving the enterprise, right? It's all about time. It's all about how we invest it. This is really the Pareto principle. So we're saying if we address 20% of the overall controls, remember there's 20 controls, 5 is 20% of 20, right? If we invest 20% of time, we can address 80% of the risk. So that's our 80-20 rule. It works out. Um, and Australian DSD says the same thing. So again, that's all this is saying is this is saying application waitlist, yeah, it's probably gonna cost us some money, and then the rest, really, we can get away with time. It's just time. We don't have to do anything special outside of sync the time, assuming certain things. All right, let me get into that. Than, thank you for listening. I thought that was funny. All right, so, really, in the quick wins, if you were to read through the SANS 20, what you would see is they have these things called quick wins, and the quick wins are the low-hanging fruit that we can take advantage of right away to improve our enterprise. And they're pretty neat because they're very easy to do. They have metrics around them. Um, they even have implementation strategies on them, and they're very easy to understand and, and consume. They essentially correspond to Plan, Do, Check, Act. Anybody familiar with PDCA, right? If you're at all involved in ISO or anything, you're gonna know PDCA. That's what this is, right? And when we talk about Plan, Do, Check, Act, really ACT is where the money investment comes from. PDC is where the time investment comes from, although when we act, it's both, right? And then regardless of what standard you're adhering to, this is relevant, okay? So, so these things you can take advantage of today, and they're free. Those controls out there are free for anybody to use, right? Um, to be truth, uh, truth be told, there are 73 quick wins. So one of the things we did in our enterprise, and you could do the same, is we listed them all out. And then we rated them and we said, look, we're going to give a red, yellow, green on these controls and how are we doing on them, right? This is what consultants get paid to do. They come into your enterprise and they do this. I've given it to you for free. You've just gotten ROI. Congratulations, right? Seriously, this is what they do. They come in, they do a risk assessment, they rate these things, and then they say, what do we need to do? All this took me was time. It didn't cost me anything. It's just a time investment. Go through it, pull out the quick wins, rate yourself on the quick wins, red, yellow, green, or whatever system you want to use. It doesn't matter. This is just a really easy way to do it, right? And again, assess it to the level of your risk appetite. Because while they may say, oh, you should do this, your enterprise may not be susceptible to that because your business processes or the way you have your architecture, right, does not necessarily indicate that that risk is present. So you're going to do this to your, to your level of risk appetite, okay? So make sure that somebody who understands your network and understands those risks is somebody who's involved in doing this, okay? So let's actually talk about some of the things that can help you. Now, a couple of caveats here. Number one, I'm not gonna tell you about a tool unless I've used it myself and I found it to be effective or a peer has recommended it to me whom I trust, okay? So I will not, I'm not a shill, I don't care. I'm generally vendor agnostic. There's very few vendors that I truly hate, maybe one or two. They were here, but they're gone now, okay? 
And I do focus on Windows systems uh, because I see them as being higher risk, not because Windows sucks, but because the ubiquity of Windows. It's everywhere. So yeah, it's going to be higher risk. So when we talk about this stuff in this context, generally, when we talk about the Windows systems, they're going to be higher risk because of their ubiquity versus their actual security. Because believe it or not, you can make a Windows system pretty darn secure and usable. So another thing to remember, cheap does not equal free. It does not equal free. Cheap and free are two different things. Cheap is not permanent. It is a bridge. This should tide you over until you can get adequate funding or get adequate tools or get the things you need introduced into your enterprise to help you do what you need to do. Cheap is also relative. What is cheap for me may not be cheap for you. Cheap could also be things that are included. So if you have an enterprise agreement and you can take advantage of services like AppLocker and BitLocker, you're getting application white, link and, uh, application white listing and encryption for free, right? It's included. It's included with the EA. Um, cheap can be something that's low cost for an enterprise. Cheap can be open source or free and open source software, right? It doesn't have to be, but it can be. And then cheap is generally more expensive in terms of time. And that's what you have to remember. So cheap can't be something that you permanently side with, right? Don't cut corners. So let's talk about a couple of tools. This is a really busy slide. I used to have all these transitions, but I got rid of transitions a while ago because it bugs me. CSC 1 and 2, so the critical security controls 1 and 2, talk about having an inventory of authorized and unauthorized hardware and software. CSC 1 is all about hardware. CSC 2 is all about software. Basically, what they're saying is build inventory lists of the things that are in your network and make sure that you track those lists. There are cheap and easy ways to do this. For instance, for hardware, you could run Nmap scans. You could download. Nmap is a free tool. You can write scripts or wrappers around Nmap. You can scan your network on some frequency and inventory all of your assets that way. It's not going to be a deep inventory, but you're going to know when something is there and when something goes away. And that's really what they're saying that you should do. Right? So Nmap is one way to do that for hardware. On the software side, uh, something like SCCM or something that would be included with your Active Directory, for example, an inventory client that would allow you to inventory the software assets on your network. All right? That exists as part of your enterprise agreement. It exists as part of your Active Directory. It's there. Whether or not you're using it is a different thing. But I guarantee you these tools are there. You could go the pay route. This is what we do in my enterprise for two grand actually less than two grand, five dollars less than two grand. You can buy a tool called Landsweeper. Landsweeper is fantastic. We've been using it for years. What it does is it does SNMP queries on the network on some frequency that we set up. It gathers all the inventory data and it's detailed deep data about every asset. I can see every client. I can see everything installed in every client. I can see every user who's ever logged into that client and it keeps a historical database. It's an invaluable resource for us because we can go in at any time and go, for DHCP, for example, if something happened and it was assigned a DHCP address, we can go to that DHCP address in Landsweeper and go, who was logged into this system? And we can see it for two grand a year. That's nothing, right? That is cheap. I can't say enough good things about Landsweeper. But again, I'm just a customer. I'm not a shill. Your mileage may vary. You try it out. They probably have free trials and things like that. It's been so long since we've used it, I don't even remember anymore. But I made sure I verified the price before I... I came and talked to you. I was like, is it still two grand? Yeah, it is. All right, cool. <laughs> right? Now, the, the pitfalls of Landsweeper is that it is a pull client. So you're not going to get inventory data that's live and up to date, right? Like as if you were to run like uh, Bell Manage on, a, on an endpoint that's constantly pushing inventory information to a server, right? This is a pull method where it's querying. So if the, the asset isn't there when the query interval runs, it's going to miss it, right? So there are some, some problems that you have to work with. But generally, it's a pretty good tool. Um, in CSC3, which talks about um, how you, see, I knew I was going to forget. I do this every time. Anyway, you see it, use SCCM for CSC3. That's what I'll say. It's right here. It's secure configurations. So secure configurations is really all about making sure you have all this stuff. And I just bolded the stuff in red so you can see it. So standard secure configuration, use of standardized image, removal of unnecessary accounts, which is a big deal because, damn it, I don't know why they include all this bloat in enterprise products. The consumer products, okay, I get it. You know, they're trying to, to pander to the lowest common denominator. But in the enterprise, they should probably be a little bit more careful with it, but that's, that costs money for them. Removal of unnecessary services, apply patches, close 
uh, open and unused network ports. How many of you actually do this? How many of you actually look at your endpoints and go, you know what? Nothing ever uses these ports. Let's just close them off until somebody requests that they're open. I'm not surprised. Guess what? We don't either because it takes time. But it's a good thing to do. Close them off. And if you have a change management process, have people say, oh, I need this port open. Great. You make one push to the whole network, port's open on the end client. But until then, it's secure. And your port scanners, when they scan, will see them as closed and move on. It's a good thing. It's a good tactic, right? Uh, these images should be validated and refreshed on a regular basis. So you should have some process where you go through and you revalidate them. An interesting thing, I have, a, I have a colleague in the back and I was talking to him about this and I said, you know, it, it occurred to me that while we do this, and that's really great, the one step that we actually forget here is after we update our image, we don't then deploy it out back to the, the endpoints. So don't forget that, right? If you're gonna if you're gonna harden your image, which is an awesome thing, don't let the newest guy who entered the company be more secure than the guy that's been there 20 years. <laughs> that's probably a backwards way of thinking about it. So make sure you get those secure configurations out to the general public through some distribution method like SCCM or, or otherwise, right? That would be an important thing to consider. Uh, and then research. If you want want to wonder how to harden a Windows image or a Linux image or anything else. There are tons of resources out there. The really interesting thing about Windows is it actually hasn't changed that much. The UI has changed a lot, but since Windows, since between XP and now, certainly, there hasn't been a lot of change in terms of the back end and the services that you can get uh, involved with and, and harden and reduce or remove or otherwise. So even older resources out there are still valuable resources because you can look and you can see, hey, is this something I can use? Yeah, there's a screenshot of me. I just did a really simple search on uh, hardening Windows 8, I think is what I said, or hardening Windows. And this is what came up and I was like, oh, cool. You know, now I can use this stuff. And what were some of the things in there? They were like, uninstall Adobe Reader. Don't use Adobe Reader, use, use a different PDF reader. Okay, my enterprise could probably handle, handle that. They don't care about Adobe, they just wanna read PDFs. All right, is there something more secure? I don't know, right? Foxit, maybe, right? Chrome, right? Plugins for the browser, maybe, right? Remove Java, which man, I would love to do, and I'd bring my business to its knees if I did. Can't do that. However, what you can do is you can set your browser settings to click to play plugins, which means annoy your users and say, are you sure you wanna run this? They're gonna click it anyway, but that's okay. That's better than having it launch automatically. Right, it really is better because every once in a while you're gonna get that one person that goes, I'm not running anything, right? And they're not gonna click, which is cool. Take out unnecessary services. Here's a link for you. By the way, I will make these all available to you. So I put a lot of links and stuff on my presentation. So, sorry? Where what? I can email it, I can put it up on SlideShare. There's a million things I can do, whatever you like. But if you click this link here, um, it gives a bunch of Windows services that are generally uh, very low usage services, so you can turn those off, right? But And you can experiment too. I mean, get a test bed, get some users who will agree and, and use them as guinea pigs and say, look, I wanna turn some stuff off and tell me if your experience changes at all. And if their experience doesn't change over a period of time, slowly start to deploy that out. Any step you can do is better than doing nothing at all. It truly is, right? And then EMET, anybody familiar with EMET? Anybody not familiar with EMET is what I should say. Probably a lot of the room, right? EMET is the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Tool. It's a security tool issued by Microsoft. It takes a lot of hard knocks uh, because there are ways around it. But again, much like antivirus, it's something that you run to keep the noise down and it does help you. And it is free, it is included. If you are an enterprise subscriber to any Windows product, you have access to the EMET. Actually, consumers do too just a little bit different on the consumer side, okay? So you can run EMET and harden your Windows surfaces and shrink those attack surfaces, which is great. Uh, and then I, I included a little link to a hardening guide down there. Um, and again, I don't know anything about these. I All I did was surf to them, check them over and say, does this make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, that's I'm doing like really high level recon. I'm just doing it for you. So I've invested your time. You're already, more ROI. Look at that, isn't that awesome? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Try the veal. Okay, so CSC 12 talks about controlled use of administrative privilege, which is a really, really important concept. In fact, of all the critical controls, I'd say this is the one that you need to focus on first because patching takes time. Uh, knowing what patches to release takes time. Application whitelisting takes a lot of time and energy and money. 
but this is one that you could do today. This is like a this is like a go home or go back to work on Monday and make this happen kind of deal, right? Reduce the amount of administrative privilege in your network. Here are two very specific things that I will recommend for you. You have two groups in Active Directory. One is called Enterprise Admins, one is called Schema Admins. You should never have user accounts that sit in those groups ever. If administrators need access to those to make changes to the enterprise or to the schema, they add themselves to the group, they make the changes, and they take themselves out. And this is really easy for you to audit. I, I, I was doing it manually for a while. Just periodically, I'd look up and I'd go, is anybody in here? And if they were, I'd call them up and say, get out. Don't do that, right? Because if they get popped and they have access to this, your Active Directory is owned. It's all over. So there's nothing you can do. Right, except for restore from backup, and hopefully you're verifying your backups. Got a story about that for you later. All right? So seriously, no account should ever idle in these groups, period. Also, look at things like domain admins and domain workstation admins. Look at those groups. Do you need all the accounts that are in there? Right? Do you? Your admins might complain, yes, we do. Then you ask them, how often do you use this account? Well, I use it all day for everything. Okay, do you need to use that account for everything? Chances are you don't, because as a super user of any system, there is no super user I have ever, ever been aware of in 20 years that has always needed super user access to do whatever they need to do in their systems. In fact, I have found their super user access is probably 10 to 20% of the time, 80% of the time they can get away with normal access, right? That is very true. In our enterprise, I require the admins to have two accounts. You have your normal account and your, your domain account. And if I catch you using your domain account to do regular stuff, and I do do spot checks, I'm going to bust you. That's the way it works. That's the deal, right? I will enable you to do your job, but you have to do your job in a risk-averse way. That's the deal that we make, right? Uh, don't name the account, by the way, like, here's my Joe account, and here's my admin Joe account. That's just bad practice. Don't do that, right? Do, uh, what we do in our enterprise is we have their name and then, like, a really long name, like their full first, middle, last, or something like that, right? So for, to an outsider, it looks like a regular account. It doesn't look like it would be an admin account. Make it distinct but not obvious. And then can you enforce second factor, right? If you don't have second factor deployed in your enterprise, start with your admins. Go to them and say, look, we, we need to do this, and it makes sense to do it with you guys. Let's do this. This is what we started with in my enterprise. We had admins that were logging in from the outside through the VPN, and we go, okay, look, we know we can't mass spam the users with second factor enforcement. So we're going to start with the admins. We went to them, we talked to them, we said, we want to do this. They generally were agreeable. That's fine. They understood it. They understood why it needed to be done. They understood they were very high risk because they were coming in from the outside. Now what we're doing is now we're internal to the network and we're going, okay, now we want you guys to start to doing it with internal stuff too. For our critical infrastructure, we're going to deploy second factor authentication and you're going to need to second factor when you RDP into any of our critical servers. Okay. We've gotten them used to it. So now it's just second nature. Sure, no problem. And it's not every server. Notice I didn't say every server because there are things that I'm willing to let them do and not hassle them about because it's a hassle. I'm not going to say it's not, but it is. However, in a risk prevention mindset, this is something that's really easy to do. You know, you can get free if you have an EA. Uh, Microsoft bought Phone Factor a while ago. You can use Phone Factor. I don't think Phone Factor is the best two-step two method out there, but it's better than nothing, right? We used it for years. It was fine. It worked. It was just limited, right? Now we've moved on to something that's that's a little bit more robust that I like, right? So further th shrink your attack surface. To prevent brute forcing, there are tools that you can run, such as fail to ban. And I love fail to ban. I've been using fail to ban for years on my home network. It's the greatest thing ever. It has screwed me over personally so many times, but I smile every time because I know I'm protected, right? Uh, win fail to ban is the Windows version of it. Essentially what it does is it monitors logs for failed login attempts and after thresholds that you set, it just adds that IP to a ban list. And the next time you try to log in, it's like, nope, you're banned. And you can do all kinds of stuff with it. You can set it so it removes it and all this stuff. This is a great tool. You know, leverage this tool, especially again, critical infrastructure, look for it. We run it on our Linux servers. We don't yet have it on our Windows servers, but it's a really, really good tool. Fail to ban coupled with SSH, your Linux boxes are almost invulnerable to brute forcing. They really are. Uh, for web apps, don't fail your password attempts in a predictable way. Don't show a 404, you didn't, uh, you weren't properly authorized because you entered the wrong password. Oh, did I now? 
hmm, let me try this password, right? Don't do that. Don't give them any more information than they need, okay? Uh, for example, most websites return uh, an HTTP 401 by default, right? And it says, oh, you have a password failure. Some other websites, though, will return HTTP 200 success, but we couldn't log you in. So you successfully access the resource, but we couldn't authenticate you. That's a much better error than saying that you had a failed password because now the attacker is not really quite sure what happened, right? And they have to keep trying and trying and trying. And if you have something coupled with fail to ban, those, those methods are going to, to fail eventually, right? Uh, vary the behaviors if you can to fool automation because automation looks for these things, right? It looks for these common, common uh, errors across sites, right? And if you can vary, vary these sites or vary the errors that are returned, that's great. The automation then gets fooled. Um, there's a, a link to an OWASP page that talks about blocking brute force attacks for web apps, right? If you're not using OWASP web resources, do it. It's free. Go to the OWASP site, 35 OWASP controls. If you implemented three of them that you didn't have today, you're better off than you were yesterday. It's not hard. This is not rocket science, and it's all basic stuff. It's just literally knowing where to go. Easy second factor. I use Duo. Again, I'm not going to shill for Duo. I just happen to be a customer. I like the product. I can use their product to enforce second factor on my server so my admins are required to use second factor when they log into my critical infrastructure, right? If you have a small team, you can get it for free. If you have a slightly larger team, like 15 or 20 people, it's like three bucks a month per user. Is your question? No, I've used them both. And I think they're fine. We use Google, uh, we're a Google shop. So we use Google by default for authentication for, for two-step, right? But, you know, I've used Okta, I've used Authy, I've used Google. They all do the same thing. It's all two-factor. Those are both, you know, top P, T-O-T-P, right? One-time password generators. So they work exactly the same way. But no, I do not have a preference, honestly. Duo allows me some more versatility, which is why I favor it, because it allows me to install integrations at the server level so I can enforce second factor on RDPs, for example. That's why I like them, right? Versus web apps, because that Authy and Google would only apply to anything that would use OAuth, right? Which would be essentially web. And then phone factor, I talked about that already. You can go out there, you can look at phone factor, just search for it and say, oh, what is this? Chances are it's included with your EA. You have access to it, right? In some small capacity. Because again, think about what I said. I've got admins that I apply this to. It's not a very large group. Our admin group is not that large. So this is what I apply my second factor controls for. Now, yeah, would I like to apply it across the enterprise? Sure, that'd be awesome. All right, the business isn't ready for it. And I'm not ready to move at that speed for them. So I'm going to mitigate the risks I can, the things that I can control, things that I can control with my time, and just go make a deal with the admins. Guys, I need you to do this. All right, cool. All right? That's what it is. Use threat modeling. Anybody use threat modeling today? Outside of the web apps. Not surprised. This is important. I, I predict, right? And remember, I don't know what I'm talking about. I predict that threat modeling is going to become like the new hype cycle, the new thing. However, I actually believe in threat modeling. It's a really, really good practice. Basically, this is red teaming, but it's red teaming where you're not asking a, uh, an outside entity to own your network. It's red teaming to the extent where you are thinking like an attacker, you're plotting a path through your network, you're looking at that path to say what controls exist along that path, and then you test those controls. It's a very, very simple thing. It's a big time sink. It's big. We're not able to do it yet. We're working toward it. But threat modeling is an awesome thing. And if you can get it done, you're going to learn about your network, and you're going to learn about these things that you can control at a basic level that will mitigate some of that risk for you. Right? Everybody understand threat modeling? It's, it's a very simple concept. It's very simple. You're just walking through the network as an attacker. What are they going to do? And then seeing what it is they have access to. It's really simple. It's reconnaissance. Um, uh, Iron Geek uploaded from Circle City Con uh, a video of Wolfgang Gorlick who talks about threat modeling, and it's a good video. So I linked it there for you. You can just go there and watch it, you know, his 40-minute talk or whatever. And uh, he's got templates and all kinds of stuff. He's, he's like really into it. All right, here's some more useful tools for you. Uh, PowerShell scripts. So there's a project that MySec did. Anybody familiar with MySec here? few people. So uh, MySec, we are a loose collection of strange individuals that get together and talk about security once a month. I don't know why, but we all keep showing up. I don't know why, right? Uh, a loose collection of strange individuals. 
That could be two. That's, uh, that's, well, there is beer afterwards, so sometimes that happens, right? Uh, so, so really, we're just like-minded people where we want to talk about this stuff and we want to share. This is one of the reasons we come here. Probably half of the presentations you saw at this con were from MySec people because we really, really want to share information. We really want to talk about this stuff. Some of us are smart enough to actually do work. Remember, I'm a manager. I can't do that. But some of these guys can. And so the PoshSec project was born. And PoshSec is a collection of Windows shell scripts, PowerShell scripts, that allow you to do implementation of some of the SANS 20 stuff, like instant response, uh, reduced administrative privileges, and other things. It's well worth checking out because it's, it's an easy site to navigate. And if you know anything about PowerShell, you can have access to the, to the source. And then you can modify them as needed or put them in wrappers or whatever you need to do to do some automation. PowerShell is pretty slick. If you don't have anybody in your enterprise that knows PowerShell, I believe this is a good investment of your time. And it will not cost you anything uh, because there are a lot of free resources out there, but it will cost you time. It is a development language, so you need somebody with a development mentality, but it's cool, right? My background was shell scripting. I was a big shell scripter for years and years and years in the 90s. When I saw PowerShell, I'm like, I am all over this. There's all kinds of stuff I can do, but it's a weird combination of object-oriented and shell. It's, it's, like, it's hard for me to grasp so much, but there are guys that come behind me that are like, yeah, no problem, boom, rip the stuff out, and wow, I have automation all of a sudden that I didn't have. PowerShell, take advantage of it, it's great. Uh, network forensics, Wireshark, right? Wireshark is the networking tool, period. If you don't know how to use Wireshark, go home Monday, learn it. And you can't learn it in a day. You can't learn it in a year. There's so much in it. It's huge, it's massive. But if you can learn a little bit about it, it tells you so much about what's happening in your network or for whatever thing you're looking at it for that it gives you capability and it gives you understanding that you didn't have before. Wireshark is an essential tool for every enterprise and you should be using it. That's all I'm going to say about it because literally it is, I mean, that's that's like a, a whole con by itself, the Wireshark con, Wirecon, right? Password cracking. I'm a big advocate of password cracking. I think that every enterprise should engage in this, okay? There are some legal issues around it. There's some sensitivity issues around it. I get that. But when you have instances where you bring in an outside pen tester and you tell them, here, try to own my network, and within one hour they've broken your system administrator's passwords because they were weak, that changes my perspective. That's a true story. That happened to me. So now I advocate highly for my staff to do all the password cracking they want, and I, as the, the big man, will take the risk. Sure, go for it. And if you crack the executive's password, don't tell them, tell me. I'll send a message, right? But seriously, everybody should do this. And the reason you should do it is you should see if you're using good standards or not. Here's a, a scary thing. When you go into your Active Directory and you enforce complexity, which requires people to use numbers, letters, and symbols, or whatever rules that you've designed for complexity, um, those rules don't always take. So how do you prove that? If you're relying on your system to say, yes, I want you to do this, but for some weird reason, it hasn't actually applied that rule, how do you know that, right? Unless you're actually actively testing it. And the only ways to really test it is to change your password a bunch of times and see if it, see if it actually changes or, you know, engage in stuff like this to see if there are really weak passwords out there. If you find a password on your network that's all alpha characters, but it should be alpha, lower, and complexity, there's a problem with the account or there's a problem with the, the, the setting in the directory and you need to go check it, right? That's a big risk. So I advocate for password cracking and cane enable is the tool. Okay, if you don't know cane enable, learn it. It's so easy to use and it's so great when it works. You're just like, yeah, look at that. Oh. That's, really, that's what it is. It's like the five stages of grief, you know? Eh. And then I put a link for you at the bottom there where you can grab word lists um, and just massive, you can wage massive dictionary attacks on your password. Uh, with the, your password file with these word lists, right? So policy and governance. Don't overlook policy and governance. They are very, very important tools to use for any security professional, and especially when we talk about basics, and especially when we talk about cheap. Policy and governance are the cheapest things you can do in your organization to make a difference. And the only investment you need to make, again, is time. Time is the only investment here. They can manage your security workload. They can help you out in legal uh, situations, too. You can have policies and governance that you can fall back on if you run afoul of legal troubles to say, well, this is our process. This is what we said we could do. Essentially, all governance is, is you say you do something and then you prove that you do it. That's all it is. It's a really simple concept. 
we wrote down that we were going to do this step one, two, and three, and then here's the evidence that we did step one, two, and three. That's what it is. And it helps. It helps tremendously, right? Change management is a big part of policy and governance. Who manages your changes? Who approves your security changes? Do you document those changes? Documentation is key for security. Key. It's key for really every practice, but in security especially. We got to write stuff down, and we're bad at it, right? Write it down. Who reviews your security changes for accuracy? Is it you? Are you the subject matter expert? If you're somebody who knows about firewalls, but you're not really a firewall admin, should you be approving firewall changes? The requests that come to me for the firewalls generally are IP ranges. We want to open this IP and have it talk to this. I say, show me a diagram of what you want to do. They show me the diagram, I go, cool, great. If a firewall rule changed to me that said we want to move rule 89 to, to place 87 and do this and that, I would be like, I can't approve this. There's no way. I don't have the understanding to know what that change is going to cause. I'm going to send that off to somebody who can, right? So partner. Partner with people who can help you. If you're responsible for security changes, but you're not comfortable approving that change, get somebody who can and say, look, I want to trust you to, to advise me on this, but I will accept the risk of the approval, right? That's a really good partnership. That works really, really well. Who follows up to verify the changes are still accurate? Because over time, this stuff kills us. Anybody ever heard of Target, right? It's changes over time that killed them. I had the, the great pleasure to attend the Gartner Symposium a few weeks ago, and I got to pal around with somebody from Target the whole time. And I talked to them, and I said, will you give me some answers off the record? And he was like, yeah. And so I talked to him about some things, and I go, I'm going to tell you, this is what I think happened from the outside. He's like, yeah, you're right. right. So everything I was thinking of was correct, which was, you know, they let their changes grow out of control. They lost track of what was actually changing. They didn't understand how those changes impacted future changes. And it was all about time. It was just, it was not enough resources, not enough time to do it. But this is something you can stay on top of, and it can help you. Document your reasons for change. And then my three key words are, are you sure? This is what I always ask. I ask myself, I ask my staff, I ask everybody. Oh, we're going to do this thing. Okay, what is it going to do? This and this and this. Are you sure? What's it going to look like after it's done? Oh, it's going to look like this. Are you sure? Those are good words to ask, right? It's measure twice, cut once. Same, same concept. One of the things we do, which I recommend everybody does, establish a governance calendar. Have a calendar of events that says, hey, this is what we do. It's really cool. It helps you in two ways. Number one, it, it allows you to prioritize the work that comes in. So when work comes on a regular schedule, you can say, oh, yeah, that's coming. We can work it in. And it allows you to show management that you actually do work. Because sometimes security is like this big mystery, right? It's this big black hole question mark. We don't know what goes on over there. You just pull out the calendar. You're like, well, we do this. This is what we do, right? And what would that look like? Uh, it would probably look something like this. This is a really super simple governance calendar. Uh, there are four quarters in a year. Three of those quarters, we're going to review the Active Directory. Two of those quarters, we're going to do network reconnaissance and do some threat modeling. Uh, three times, we're going to test our backups. We get our T DR test at the end of the year. Uh, and then we have our mid-year audit. And then those are the responsibles. That's why there's different shapes. It's a great visualization technique. You show this to any C-level, they immediately understand. Oh, cool, great. Back to work. Don't want to hear about it anymore. Thank you. Right? Good. Maybe you can use this tool to avoid conversation. That's good too, right? Sometimes. But do this. It's really easy to do. Use Google, Google Calendar. Use your internal calendaring thing. Set up reminders for these events. But definitely generate this artifact. This is a really good artifact. It's a good talking point. So what's the weakest link? Anybody know? That's right. All of you and everybody like you, who is a homo sapien. So social vectors, really the cheapest thing you can do, the cheapest thing you can do and get the most ROI is talk to your users. I cannot think of anything cheaper that you can do in your enterprise to mitigate risk and address the security fundamental than go and talk to people. Note, do not lecture. Note, do not debate. That's not our capacity. Our capacity as educators is to educate. So you talk to them. Hey, how's it going? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Oh, yeah. You got kids? Yeah. Oh, they use Facebook? Yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah, they know about privacy settings on Facebook, right? How they can they can set it so only their friends can see their posts? Oh, no, no. I don't know how to do that. Well, let me show you how. That's huge. I showed that to a bunch of people. There's a story that I tell about security awareness. Greatest story in the world. I sat down. I did this whole presentation on security awareness. I was doing a road show at my company, and I was at a, a plant were an uh, industrial manufacturer. And um, I had these guys come in 
that had just come in from working in like a thousand degree conditions, scrubbing a stack of soot and dust. And they come into a conference room to hear me talk about security awareness, right? Awesome. They're there to be in the air conditioning, all right? That's why they're there. So I started talking to him, and I was talking about Facebook and all this stuff. And these guys are listening, and I'm, I'm doing this stuff. And they go, if we bring our wives in, could you tell this story to our wives? I'm like, well, let's go ask the plant manager, I guess. We asked him. He was like, yeah, we have family stuff here all the time. Bring them in. They brought their wives in the next day. I did security awareness training for their wives to talk about that kind of stuff. The, the important part of that story was that I connected with them at a personal level, and I got them to understand what it is I needed them to do. The, the th thinking is, if we can train them in this behavior in their pri private and personal lives, it's going to carry over to the enterprise, which is a really good thing. So talking to your users, do not talk about work when you talk to them, but know where you're going, right? You're socially engineering them. That's what you're doing. You should be doing that. That's what we're all about. Socially engineer them to get to the point where you can talk to them about send something, send them a message, do it. One of the things that we've done that I want to I wanna start doing again, and it got such great response, we created a newsletter at the end of the year, <clears throat> and we showed people how to shop online. We were like, yeah, you want to shop online? Here's a few sites you can go to. Here's some notes about credit card fraud. You know, if you're worried about credit card fraud, here's this, here's that. And we published it right before Black Friday, so right around Thanksgiving. And they were like, wow, this is great. This is awesome. That's a great tool for you to use. A simple newsletter. And just distribute it. Pass it out. Get permission. Right, because we have this whole thing in my organization where I got to get permission for everything, but that's fine as long as they let me talk to them. That's that's all I care about, right? Or put something on a bulletin board, say, "Oh, here's this thing," right? That's cool, but get to them, get to them. This is the cheapest thing you can do. This will lower the most risk in your enterprise. It costs you nothing but time. You might even get a beer out of it, right? That's an awesome thing. So. I did talk a little bit about recovery, a word on recovery. There really is no cheap option for recovery, but recovery is not something you can ignore, unfortunately. Um, we experimented with a few things. I've looked at a few things personally. There are things in the consumer space that work for recovery that do not work in an enterprise. Any tool with the word toy in it is not enterprise ready, period. We learned this lesson. We tried this. We tried to cut corners. We tried to synchronize our file servers with a Microsoft tool that had the word toy in it. It destroyed, the, the DFS traffic destroyed the network. Destroyed it. Because the people involved just didn't think about it. All they were focused on was, oh, it's free. Yeah, free and sucky, right? What did it cost us in the end? It cost us a hell of a lot more to back out of that than it would have to approach it in a sane way, right? But recovery is something that you need to consider. It is something that you need to spend money on. Spend it wisely, right? Tool of your choice. Don't care what you what you use. I've, I've seen a, a million of them over the years, and in my opinion, they all do the same thing, right? But look at recovery and make sure that you have a recovery strategy because this is your final line of defense. When something really bad happens, like crypto wall, which has happened again in my enterprise, which I'm unhappy about, right? We've had two visits from Mr. Crypto Wall now. Recovery has been my only option, okay? Your mileage may vary. Big, 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 big caveat there. Your mileage may vary. Everything I talked to you about was based on my personal experience. It's based on things I've done that I've seen that I'm interested in. Your mileage may vary. But take what I've said, kind of, you know, make some little nuggets out of it, package it up and go, yeah, maybe we can do something with this and, uh, and do something with it. That's the key. Do something with it, right? Here's the list of tools and references. Like I said, I'll make this available. I can email it to you, whatever. I've got some business cards here that I'll leave. Go up, feel free to take those whatever you like. Um, I definitely want to say thank you, huge thank you to the Gurkhan staff, especially Egg Drop X and Pink Nightmare for making it happen again for four years in a row, which is just spectacular. I think it's great. Um, thanks to MySAC. Thank you for you, you know, for, for giving me your attention and thinking about the basics. Because again, don't get caught up in the hypocalypse. Think about those basics, right? Here's some contact info. Again, we'll include this. Feel free, Twitter me, email me, call me. I have no problem. I will take a call from anybody and talk about anything at any time. I might tell you to see a personal therapist, but I will talk to you about anything you want to talk about, right? No problem. It happens all the time. Uh, so yeah, any questions? Yes, sir. Land sweeper, landsweeper.org. One word, just go out there and it's, like I said, they might have a free trial. You can set it up, it's super easy to configure. And the reports that come back are great. You know, we run it. We run uh, Active Directory security groups on it, so we restrict access to the reports. I mean, it's, it works really well for us. 
It might not work for you, but it works really well for us. Not very, because it's SNMP, and uh, it's it's SNMP. It's using SNMP traffic, so it's actually it's pretty low level traffic, and the the scans that we have set up uh, because kind of. The way our network is distributed, we have 430 physical locations. So kind of how we scan things, we stride it throughout a, a big period. So really, you don't notice it at all. It causes hardly any any blips on the, the radar at all. Did you have a question? Yeah, I would assume. I, I'm going to be fair to you and say I don't know, but I'm going to assume yes. Yeah, anybody else? Yes, sir. Local accounts? Like local admin? So we are using a whitelisting product that's called Viewfinity. And Viewfinity is pretty expensive, but it does application whitelisting for us, and it allows us to grant local administrative privileges per machine. So it's like a policy-based software that runs on the, the endpoint that allows you to do that. Another way you can do that is you can enforce it through GPOs and, and allow you know, administrative access that way. We, we have a a current scheme where we deny access. If an account is created, it gets removed by a GPO, but then we have an exception to that GPO, which allows it. It's kind of kind of clunky, but it works. You can do that. But Vfinity is our, our tool of choice, certainly, to do that, because we want to try to get everything down to one console. Yes, sir? Next question? Uh, I have had personal experience with RSA, actually. And I, I'm going to be fair and say that I was really, really hard on RSA for a long time, especially after they got hacked. I wasn't so much upset about them about being hacked. I was very, very upset about the way they dealt with it. But they let their marketing people deal with it rather than the people who knew what was going on. And I think that was their big pitfall. Since then, I actually recently, in June, I had a discussion with the CTO at RSA. And I told him my concerns. And you know, he acknowledged some things. But he gave me some other details, too, that that really made me change my mind and go, okay, you know, I, you guys are taking this seriously enough and doing it. Um, the thing about RSA is that they are an expensive service, right? That you do require hardware tokens. Um, you've got to keep those tokens replenished. And so it's it's a difficult thing. But I would say RSA as a product, pretty solid product. I mean, they've been in the, the business for a long time. They have a very mature security consulting practice. You really can't go wrong with RSA. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Appreciate your time.